Ezekiel 47. Let's go for it. Right. This passage really lends itself to a three-point sermon because there is a beginning, a middle, and an end, okay? Three points there. So the beginning, we'll call that the source or the origin, is there's this, this trickle of water, as, as, as Loz was reading, if you remember. Get, get it open. I've got it open in front of me. Get it on your app or something. There's a trickle of water coming out under the door of the temple. That's the origins. That's the beginning. Then the middle bit is this journey through the river. So, so you start... Um, and it's ankle deep, then you go further, 500 meters or so, and then it's a knee deep, then it goes up to your waist, and then he can't put his feet on the bottom anymore. He, he's swimming in the river of God. Now, that's the middle bit. I've called that the journey, you know, of, of going along in the river. And then it ends with this extraordinary um, picture of of restoration, of transformation. And uh, the river's flowing out of Jerusalem, out of the temple, to the Dead Sea. And it's given the name Dead Sea for a very good reason, because it's dead. Um, I'm no geographist. If Jenny Wooden was here, she'd be able to tell us all the details of that. No, it's 520 meters below sea level or whatever. There's no fish in it. Um, I read one article that said it's the one place on the, uh, on the planet that Sir David Attenborough can't do a documentary about because literally there's no life on earth. It's not quite true. There's some little placking or whatever in the water. I've been there, actually. They burnt my eyeball out when I splashed and, it, and the salt went in my eye. But uh, it's dead. But yet the picture that Ezekiel sees is of fish, just like the Mediterranean, abundance of fish, and then there's trees, there's life, there's trees, there's fruits. That's the passage. The beginnings, the journey, and the fruitful end. And here's the context that we've been looking at all these recent weeks as we go to exile. So can I have the title slide up there? And uh, so this is the promise of his river. The promise of his river. Have you ever messed up? I mean, seriously, got it wrong. I went for a walk with a guy who made a genuine mistake in his workplace. The mistake was going to cost the company tens of thousands of pounds. Not only was he facing disciplinary, he might have been even facing a prosecution if they thought he did it deliberately. Thankfully, they just moved him from one department to another. But that was a difficult weekend. People who've messed up, it may have cost you your job. It may have cost you your home. It may have cost you your family. Estranged friendships, relationships. I've been in some of those places. Many of you now know, because it's no secret, but yeah, I ended my school days by getting expelled from school. Lewis loves me to tell the story, and it gives me street cred with some of the older teens, I don't know, but I laugh about it now, but I, I remember you know, the, the look of disappointment on my mum's face when she read that letter from the head teacher. And that Latin phrase, Persona non grata. I was no longer welcome. And then there's the stuff I can't talk about. The, the employment disciplinaries that, God, I can't even go there. I'm so embarrassed. And I think God just has put the shutters down and closed the road and just saves me from... But these things plagued me until... The day, and some of you know this phrase because I've used it a few times in my 12 years here. The day when the, when the monster, when the dragon comes out of the cellar. And I was undone. I picked up the phone. I, I spoke to a Baptist minister. He was more than twice my age. I'd only met him on two occasions at a worship event that we sort of clicked together. 
and then at some boring business meeting where we didn't really talk particularly. And I just picked him up. Praise God. Talk about divine appointments. He'd already been praying for me. He knew something was building. He just read it over my, my life. We saw each other, and then 24 hours, 48 hours later, I was in his office in his church building and just weeping on the floor. You know, when you're really broken, and it's not just the water from the tears, it, the water coming out of your eyes, it's the phlegm that drops out your nose and all. It was, I just howled over my mistakes. And do you know what I heard? This man, more than twice my age, who'd met me only on two occasions, only once, the, where we exchanged conversation, he started to prophesy hope into my life. I'll tell you what, I still remember those words. I still know those prophecies. Because when you're broken, your ears are wide open to God. Do we have the phrase, do anyone know, like, do you know God's telephone number? I'm sure there's a song or something, Jeremiah 333, is it? But Jeremiah 333, can we have that slide up? Call to me, I've put me with a capital M because God's speaking. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Promise of restoration. I put promise of restoration on that. Because that's the title of that entire chapter in Jeremiah 33. This is before the full extent of the exile. And God is already speaking hope into these broken lives. These, these people who've messed up selfishly at times. And God's starting to speak hope. What a great scripture. And that's exactly what I experienced back in the early 1990s when all this happened. This man in my brokenness prophesying into my life. We're in exile, or they're in exile. <laughs> we've been in exile for the last four weeks, or maybe, maybe we've been in exile for the last 12 months, I don't know. And yet Ezekiel sees a valley of dry bones, desolation, destruction, and the promise of resurrection. And 10 chapters on, we're here. There's a river. It's coming out of the newly built temple, and it's going to transform what we thought were dead, barren areas. In the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our failure, God is speaking promises of hope. At the heart of our gospel is resurrection. But you can't resurrect Something that, you know, you, you need a death for a resurrection. And God loves restoration, but you can't have restoration unless there's something broken that needs to be mended. They say history is written by the victors. And we know historically that's true. But I'll tell you who's writing your history. God. And as we learned a few weeks ago from Mark and Jane, most of Israel's history was written or edited at this point. This is when we started to get those books appearing, Samuel and Chronicles, Kings, and all, all the way from Joshua. It was written in this period. These were not the victors, but they were writing their history. And what an extraordinary history. Warts and all is the phrase we use. There's Gideon, the mighty warrior, who we encounter hiding in fear of his life. There's David, the great king, who totally messes up in the middle. And then there's Hezekiah, who brings an extraordinary revival to the nation and messes up at the end. Look at that. Beginning, middle, and end. Didn't even know I was going to do that. Gideon, he wasn't in any fit state at the beginning. David, he messes up big time in the middle. And Hezekiah, he loses it all at the end. But that's God's history because God believes in restoration. Starting as a little trickle, but it's going to transform the worst Dead Sea scenario you can 
imagine. And you can never be disqualified because in your brokenness, God speaks hope. Let's pull it into New Testament. There's a verse. It's not on the slides. Don't panic, Rachel. Um, but it's, um, if I've got it from in my head, Romans 5, 8 works for this. That God demonstrates his love for us that when we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. While we were still messed up, God's rescue plan was delivered. Amen. Amen. And it starts with connecting with God. So this beginning, middle, end passage of Ezekiel 47, it starts with that place of connecting in the temple. And the temple there doesn't specifically reference um, the source of God. You know, their theology is developed now. We're, we're learning a lot in the exile. These people are coming back. They're monotheistic now. They have a far greater understanding of things. This actually more represents fellowship and, and corporate gathering. That's what you did in the temple. You worshipped and you praised and you were together. And can we have that wonderful verse from Mark chapter um, three, and um, I just want to read, I love this verse. He, Jesus that is, watch the direction of travel. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So first, just hold that there. First, he's drawing them to himself to be with him and then to send them out under his anointing. I did a youth weekend, oh, 10 or 12 years ago, called Out Through the Indoor. And, uh, and the idea was before we go out into mission, we have to first come in, out through, come in to the presence of God. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Yeah, you there's a great narrative in number 16, but I'm not going to go there. I've just mentioned it, Drat. But uh, Moses and Aaron and pushing into the tent of meeting to stop a plague in the land. It's very relevant, actually. You read it later. Um, I was on a mission trip uh, years ago. But it's a good story, so bear with me. Um, I was in Argentina, and uh, there was an international team. We'd all flown down. We were in air-conditioned coaches and staying in really posh hotels and having meals. Ago. Probably about 50, 60 of us, most from the United States, us two from the UK, uh, someone from Hong Kong, I think, uh, mainly from the, from the States. And then we would get divided up into smaller groups uh, to do mission in the afternoon. So there's about 12 of us went off in a rickety coach to this sort of really, really poor area of Buenos Aires. And there we met some locals from the local church and some other Argentine leaders. When I say leaders, yeah, if they said they were leaders, I'm not going to argue. They were pretty butch blokes. And uh, when they hugged you, you could smell the garlic from their salami breakfast. And they, all of them had, you know, uh, unkept beards and were you know, sort of grating on your cheeks. Nice people, nice people. I won't have a bad word said about them. Um, so we arrive at this church building. We go inside only to use a room to lock all our valuables away. You know, you don't take camera to, no, we're not tourists. We do evangelism. Sorry, I can't do the accent. I, you know, I have no, but yeah. So we lock all this stuff away and we all go out and we do two hours of evangelism. We have like postcards with information on. And when we come back, there's five or eight cards with contacts we've met, people we've prayed for, people who become Christians. Five people became Christians in two hours. That's revival, where I come from. But the face is on these Argentine leaders. Oh, they thought something was wrong. So we get back on the coach to go and have tea or whatever in the posh hotel. And he said, we need to come tomorrow one hour early. One hour early. And we said, well, we can't because we're part of the international team. That's when we're having lunch. No, 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 one hour early, we need to start. And we said, no, we're missing lunch. He said, no, no, you're not missing lunch. You're fasting lunch. It's an act of worship. So we turn up, we open the door of the church, and we walk right into the building. He switches on the PA. It's South America, if you've ever been. He switches on the PA. Boom. You can feel the speakers humming. Someone plugs in the drums, gets electric, get the guitar. We just start praising God for 45 minutes or so. Do you know what happened? Demons started to manifest mainly from the local team, <laughs> some from the international team, 
I mean, it was pretty violent. I mean, yeah, I've seen it before, but it was, yeah, full blown. People getting kicked, people on the floor. But we know what we're doing because we're trained. We're disciples. We've read our Bibles. So we sort all that out in the name of Jesus. Everyone's now back in their right mind, all closed, smiling. We go out, two hours evangelism. We come back. We've got 30 cards this time. People giving their lives to Jesus. Miracles on the street. I've, been, I've got my own stories. I can't add them now. The following day, we did exactly the same thing. An hour of worship. Thankfully, no demons that time. 60 cards. Three days of evangelism. All those contacts. You see, I've gone fishing in the Dead Sea. And it's rubbish. Because there ain't no life. I don't want to go to a Dead Sea scenario without the river of God pouring life and transformation into that situation. I tell you, Christian mission can be exhausting. We're full of clever and creative and good ideas, but it's exhausting without the river of God. Okay, I'm going to show you some scriptures now. That's enough of my stories. Here we go. The promise of the river, it's fulfilled in Jesus. I'm going to rush through this. This could have been the sermon, but I, I wasn't interested in preaching it. But some of you could be excited, so get the text down. So the river is fulfilled in Jesus. He's the temple, John chapter 2. You can tear this place down, and I will raise it in three days. Oh, you can't do that. It's took us 46 years to build this place. No, no, no. John says in the footnotes, he's talking about his body. He's the temple. You're thirsty, madam. <laughs> Polite way to speak to Samaritans. Are you thirsty, madam? If you'd asked me, you could have water and you'd never thirst again. Is anyone thirsty? Anyone? Come to me and rivers of life will flow in you. He's the river and the river flowing is the Holy Spirit. John makes it clear in John 7 verse 19. And then you have to remember, John is prophetic. Everything he speaks about is, is symbolic. And so it's only in his crucifixion narrative you get the, 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 the information about the, the piercing of the side. Now, this is physical. That's a GP or a nurse or someone. They put the spear in his side and outflowed separately blood and water. The man was dead. But John knows that when we read that, we're seeing other things. We're seeing the forgiveness of sins and we're seeing life eternal. So it's fulfilled in Jesus. And now it's fulfilled in us. We're the temple. We're the place of the beginning of the trickle of the coming river. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. I love this. I don't want to make too much of it. You know I love praise. <laughs> but I'm just interested that Paul... When he talks about being filled, he uses the concept of singing songs. Songs and psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Not once, but he does it in Colossians. He does it twice. So I'm not going to make too much of it, <laughs> but it's there. How do you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Not that you're singing, but you're singing over other people. It's the corporate. It's that corporate element. And you start in Jerusalem, you go to Judea. It's flowing. The river's flowing. Samaria. Ooh hostile territory possibly, to the ends of the earth. I don't know where your Dead Sea scenario is, but the river of God can transform it. For Jonah in the Old Testament, it was Nineveh. He had to go, go to Nineveh. I ain't going to Nineveh. I'm packing my bags. I'm going to Spain. That's the direction he went in. You know, a bunch of heathens. Um, for the people in the time of Jesus, it was Nazareth. Oh, we've just met the Messiah, they say in John chapter 1. And they say, well, from Nazareth. What good thing can come from Nazareth? I'm not going to speak anything negative about York. I love this city. I met someone on the street the other day who said that they were prayer walking around the city. God bless them. Thank you for prayer walking my city. But we know that in this city, there are places that are more Dead Sea than Jerusalem. But with the river of God, that can be transformed. 
Have I done all my slides? I have. So that must be my sir must have come to an end. Fantastic. Right. I've been doing Pat's Lent course. That's been great. I've enjoyed that. And one of the things he talked about was putting yourself in the picture. And so I did that with the river of God and I got scared because it's harrowing. We live in a city with a river and we know that there are people who fall into that river and when they get fished out, sometimes they're not breathing. And suddenly I'm in this river. It's on to my ankles. It's up to my knees. And somehow I, I've got to let go now. I'm going to be taken by the current of a river. Never in the physical do I want that to happen. It's bad enough when you get knocked over in the sea and you've only just gone plodging in, you know, and the wave comes and oh, you're on your back. Yeah, water is incredibly powerful. So this is about faith. This is about going where your feet wouldn't really want to take you. This is about letting go and letting God. This is about exercising our faith and trusting God. And at the end is fruitfulness. I don't want to be in the temple singing the songs and then rush off to the Dead Sea to do some mission. It don't work. I've got to go with the flow. Sorry, did not expect that to be a rhyming couplet. Um, but you've got to go. And it's scary. Who's up for that? Who is up for that? Okay, let's do some response. How do I respond to this? How, how do we get the river of God? Well, we know from the passage that the river of God is the Holy Spirit bubbling away in us. So we just want more Holy Spirit in our lives. It's, you know, it could be as simple as that. Rivers choose the path of last, least resistance. So if you're all worried and troubled in your mind, um, again, the Pat Lent course is brilliant for this. Write all that down in a notebook, then spend an hour in God's presence. And then when you come back to those notes, you probably won't need them anyway. They're all, God sorted them. Just get the flow of God's spirit in your life. Now, I want to speak to some very specific individuals. I'm counting this not as sermon time, but as response time. Some of you, and there's a lot of you, are feeling uncomfortable right now. You've got sort of funny feeling in your stomach. I know because I've got it. And I had it when I first wrote this sermon. Not that I ever wrote it, but whatever I do with it. Do you know what's happened? The brokenness and the mistakes of the past have, have come to the surface again. And that embarrassment and guilt, that's, that's there. But then you've got a glimmer of future hope. And that's coming in, like, like beautiful sunlight from a window. There's a crack in the curtains and it's coming in. And as those two very different emotions collide, it's giving you a funny physical feeling. And I'm talking right to you if this is you. And there's a number of you. And God's saying, go with the future even in the midst of your brokenness. And some of it, you messed up. Some of it, people just messed up around you and you were the consequence of it. I am so sorry for that. Go with the future hope. Get in the river. Yeah? Get in. I want that river. I want to be praying into the ministries we're going to be seeing in Cornerstone and, and wherever we're ministering. I want us to do it with the presence of God more than anything. It's great tonight. We're, the living. If you've never been to a living room, oh, I don't mean your living room. I mean the living room we do. That you know, this vision of Becky and Lewis's uh, back in the autumn of of bringing this praise into our homes. And, and what we're going to do, they're going to host the cornerstone envisioning. So we're going to get that prophetic praise, Beulah, that's the Hebrew word, marrying the, the intercessory warriors and the, and the apostolic stuff. And we're going to be just crying out, firstly to God and honoring him. To be honest, after we've done that, there may be nothing else to say because we just know that our heart is now synced with God's heart of converting a Dead Sea scenario into a place of abundant life. Okay, 
You need to get on the live chat. A band, we, we're ready. Are you there, Becky? Good. So we get on the live chat. Okay, I'm going to do the thing. If this was Burn Home, I'd be saying, we're going to get the prayer team out. Let's get the prayer team down the front. And if this is resonating with you, if you were saying, ah, I need to get out of this brokenness. I want to get into that future hope. I want to believe for the good things God has spoken over my life. I want to see the fulfillment of those prophecies. I've got a living testimony of this, folks. You come down now and we'll pray for you, yeah? But I can't do that. So what I'm saying is get on that live chat and I don't care what you put in there. Find an emoji. I don't know what emojis there are. Is there a drop of water one? Stick that in there. Is there a wave one? Stick that in. Give us a line of fish. Write the word river. I'm not looking for spelling correctly. I'm not even looking for good grammar. I just want people to interact and pray right now. Church, say, this is what we need. I want to get back in the river. I want to see future hope, transformation in people's lives. I need more of the Holy Spirit in my life. So, okay, so Father God, Lord, take us deeper into your presence. Overwhelm us with your presence and take us to a place where our feet can barely walk and take us because we've got to let go and let you take us further further and deeper and believing for change in my life. The chains are dropping off. The addictions are dropping off. Life is springing forth. I don't want to go to the Dead Sea without the river of God.